Welcome to YTV. I'm Madison Allward. And I'm Lily Fast. Our cover story takes you inside the throngs of pre-frosh flooding campus this week for Bulldog Days. Last Monday through Wednesday, about 1,200 students and 1,000 parents got a taste of campus culture at the 125 events hosted by extracurricular clubs and activities. Clinton Wing brings us a more information. Clinton? Thanks, Lily. For many of us, Bulldog Days was our first exposure to life at Yale. And each year, the admissions office invests a huge amount of effort to make sure that we get the best first impression and the fullest Yale experience possible. Bulldog Days is really a campus-wide event, and we start planning for Bulldog Days months and months in advance. We recruited over 600 hosts. We had over 100 professors who participated in our academic fair or um, gave a master class. All of the residential college deans and masters are on board. We work with security services, with dining services, uh, with the Yale Police, with the Yale Health Center. The entire campus is on board um, for, for Bulldog Days. We think about a campus with 5,300 undergraduates or so getting 2,300 almost uh, visitors to campus for three days. It puts a strain on a lot of systems. In recent years, the admissions office has been continuing to improve the quality of its events at Bulldog Days, including the Welcome Show and Extracurricular Bazaar two of the key parts of the program. Traditionally, we had had a sort of a showcase in Battelle Chapel, and again, it was not professionally produced and very crowded, and we think we've definitely been able to up the quality and the enjoyment level. We were able to work with, um, with a bunch of different offices around Yale, from conference services to the house managers at Woolsey to um, an outside light and sound contractor to put on um, a show that we thought had some real wow factor for folks and really made this impression um, that students are now, uh, they've now arrived at Yale and, and they truly are in a magnificent place that is full of just remarkable people. Doing. Traditionally the extracurricular bazaar actually used to be combined with the academic fair in the Lamon Center, um, but that was <clears throat> incredibly hectic. And so we actually separated them out and now the academic fair happens in the John J. Lee Amphitheater and the extracurricular bazaar happens in the Lamon Center. This gives us a lot more space. It was actually traditional that there would be so much uh, activity going on at the extracurricular bazaar that you couldn't even walk from table to table in half of the Lamon Center. Still, the admissions office emphasizes that their events are no replacement for the interactions that naturally take place between the pre-frush and current Yaleys. We know that the reasons that people choose Yale um, almost always center around personal interactions that they have with Yale students. I know that um, it's the students that are our best resource. And so our goal is not to script those interactions and it's not to get even the right admitted student with the right Yale. It's simply to facilitate the natural kinds of interactions that folks can have when they're on campus. And, um, we are confident, really, that when our admitted students interact in candid ways, in unscripted ways, in natural ways on campus, the current Yaleys are going to make a fabulous impression. The admissions office's investment in Bulldog Days certainly seems to have paid off, with parents and students alike saying that the open house has helped them lean towards choosing Yale. Just the campus, the people, it just seemed like an amazing place to be. This is like making me very, very like strongly want to go to Yale. I got to see the campus, I got to see the feel of the university, and I just love it. We hope most pre-frosh return home from Bulldog Days knowing whether Yale has the college experience they're looking for. Back to you, Lily. Thanks, Clinton. About 68% of accepted students matriculate to Yale. We'll look forward to welcoming them to campus this fall. And when they arrive on campus, the YCC hopes new alcohol policies will be well underway. Last Thursday, they released five recommendations for the University Council Committee on Alcohol, drafted using the results of a 1,500 student survey. They suggested first that the president publicly advocate reconsidering the legal drinking age, second, that the administration clearly outline alcohol policy and expand in areas where consequences are definite and note areas left vague intentionally so that the student body can better comply, 
Third, that the Yale administration and Yale Police Department should not ask students where they got intoxicated. Fourth, the administration should create a dancing and social space on campus for students who don't want to drink. And fifth, that the administration should work with the YCC, the Alcohol Task Force, and other student groups to determine effective drinking policies. YDN reporter Dan Weiner reported on President Salve's priorities in his upcoming term as university president. Levin mobilized the development of STEM fields during his presidency, adding four new science buildings and refocusing recruitment towards potential STEM students. Salve has prioritized the new biology building. The building was promised to Yale Science faculty over a decade ago and still remains a huge roadblock due to insufficient finances to fund the project. Salve also wants to improve conditions within already existing facilities. Specifically, he wants to grow and recruit faculty for West Campus. As the campus opens up in the fall, the final budget will be proposed for the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library renovation. The library will be replacing 50-year-old equipment to keep books and manuscripts from deteriorating. This follows major renovations of heating, air conditioning, and humidity systems. Beinecke Director E.C. Schroeder declined to comment on when renovations will begin. Projected costs range from $50 to $70 million. Students, faculty, and researchers will still have access to the Beinecke's materials. These requests will involve advanced processing, but Schroeder promises that the, prom that the process will be as seamless and straightforward as possible. This week, David Swenson, Chief Investment Officer and Professor, informed the news that he has no plans to leave Yale any time in the immediate future, and he plans to resume teaching his investment analysis course in the fall. Swenson was diagnosed with cancer last year, forcing him to stop teaching investment analysis in the economics department. President Levin told the news Thursday that the entire Yale community hopes Swenson will return to full health and will be back to teaching next year. On Wednesday, Matthew Nemerson, President and CEO of the Connecticut Technology Council, announced his intention to run for mayor of New Haven. This expands the field to five candidates in a hotly contested mayor race. Kojo Morase and Jen Kramer have more on the story. Thanks, Lily and Madison. Now, earlier this year, Mayor John DeStefano Jr. shocked many when he announced that he would not be seeking re-election. With elections for a new mayor coming up in November, the race is already heating up. For months, speculation abounded about who would run in the Democratic primary for mayor. One of the names often mentioned was Board of Aldermen President Jorge Perez. But Perez didn't run, and the first person to file his candidacy was Sundi Adekeda Zulu, a New Hallville plumber. Then, Ward 10 Alderman Justin Elliker declared that he would run for mayor. Since Mayor DeStefano made the unexpected announcement that after nearly two decades as mayor, he would not seek re-election, a slew of candidates have joined the race. Gary Holder Winfield, a Connecticut state representative who could not be reached for comment. Then Henry Fernandez, former New Haven Economic Development Administrator and current CEO of the consulting firm Fernandez Advisors and Matthew Nemerson, President and CEO of the Connecticut Technology Council and former President of the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. I have 35 years preparing for this uh, at the local level, at the civic level, at the state level, and I've done a lot of national things as well. I think I bring a wealth of experience about how to govern a city. I have been at hundreds and hundreds of public meetings uh, talking with you know, neighborhood meetings, block watch meetings, community soup night, whatever, you name it, I've been there because I want to be the type of mayor that people feel is accessible, that people feel they can talk with. We need a mayor who has the experience to be ready on day one. Um, I've worked extensively in city government, I've worked extensively in New Haven city government, um, was a deputy mayor for economic development here. Uh, and I am ready to go on day one. We can't keep doing the same thing year after year. People get tired and fed up. And I'm, I'm, I'm fed up and I'm tired and I'm ready to make a stand. As one of the first to declare, Elliker is in the lead in fundraising, having raised over $55,000 in contributions. Elliker, Holder Winfield, and Kata Zulu are participating in the Democracy Fund. New Haven's public financing program that limits the size of individual contributions. Around the nation and around this city, people are tired of contractors and special interests having influence over government. And so it's important that candidates participate in public financing and reduce the maximum amount that any individual can contribute. I'm able to raise funds uh, without using taxpayer dollars, um, and I feel, uh, uh, I feel comfortable uh, doing that. Um, I, I would say this, 
My background, um, I came into city government specifically um, to address issues of corruption. Um, and so uh, I think I'm the, I'm, I know I'm the only person in the race um, who's worked aggressively uh, to ensure that, um, uh, that who you know does not affect uh, what kind of city services uh, that you get. While Nemerson also questioned the effectiveness of the fund, he said that he would cap his campaign funds at $368,000. Uh, we may raise it in a slightly different way. Um, uh, we will limit ourselves, uh, assuming all the other candidates stay within $368,000. For each of the candidates, resolving poverty and unemployment is a primary focus. And I want to open up two book ed training schools for our students during the day and the adults at nighttime where they can learn a book ed skill, get their GEDs, and become uh, productive citizens of our society. The crime issues, the issues of lack of hope are because people don't have jobs. So we as a city need to make sure that we're doing everything possible to support and facilitate people getting jobs. I see the future of job growth in biotech, life sciences, and construction. I don't think there's actually one sector in New Haven uh, that's going to be the growth sector. I actually think we have to have a different approach, which is that um, we need to be a, a city that's clearly open for business uh, and that encourages uh, entrepreneurs uh, across the spectrum of uh, opportunities. The only way that people get lifted out of poverty is if an outside force invested, invests capital into some place near them that creates the opportunity for them to participate in building wealth. The good thing right now is that the world is awash in money. There are trillions of dollars in sovereign wealth funds from China to Singapore. Uh, there will soon be investment dollars flowing out of Europe because they seem to be in a bit of stagnation. Fernandez, Nemerson, and Elika, who all attended either Yale's law school or school of management, hope to maintain a measured relationship with Yale. While Yale is a, uh, is a big employer, Yale um, brings a tremendous amount of energy and wisdom. Uh, we also have a city uh, that's full of wonderful people uh, who are smart, hardworking, uh, and the role of the mayor is to make sure that no institution, uh, not Yale uh, or, or any of our universities or any of our uh, giant businesses um, or whatever the case may be, um, overwhelms the rest of the city. This is a situation where everybody has a gun pointed at everybody's head. The city cannot fail for Yale and Yale remain a globally competitive, fabulous institution that's attracting people from around the world. On the other hand, uh, the community does not succeed, and yes, unless Yale feels comfortable investing, expanding, and becoming an even larger and dominant institution. I ultimately believe you get more with a carrot than a stick. Yale needs to play by the rules, like every other entity in the city, and that's an important thing, particularly when Yale's developing. Uh, but at the same time, there's huge potential for collaboration in the city with Yale. The candidates had the chance to discuss this and many more topics at Saturday's mayoral debate hosted by the Yale College Democrats. As the primary draws closer, they hope to get their message out to New Haveners. The regular Joe, just like me, with ideas to step up to the plate and be a leader, be a mayor, be a governor, and change the direction that this country is going in. The coming era of New Haven is going to require tremendous partnerships uh, where people will be sharing power, and I have the emotional and technical ability to do that. What this election will be about is attitude, it'll be about integrity, it'll be about new energy and a new direction for New Haven. It's about making a difference for New Haveners, um, but it's about doing that in a way in which we are all lifted up together, one city, that we all benefit from each other's success. So for now, candidates are still revving up their campaigns, hoping that come November, they'll be the ones elected to occupy this office. With YTV, this has been Kodro Marasi and Jen Kramer. Back to you. Among the people still speculated to join the mayoral race are Hill House High school principal Kermit Carolina, who formed an exploratory committee several weeks ago. Now we turn to Patrice Bowman inside the Chinese American Students Association to show us the group's latest undertaking, a colorful cultural showcase filled with dance, song, and much more. Patrice? Thanks, Maddie and Lily. 
Last Friday, Yale's Chinese American Student Association enlivened the SSS building with CASA's Got Talent. This display of diverse talent showcased the many facets of Chinese culture for students from both inside and outside CASA. So CASA, the Chinese American Students Association, is to basically promote Chinese culture, um, I guess, throughout the campus. So not only Chinese students, but also um, non-Asian. Unlike other shows from the group's past, which presented acts without audience feedback, CASA's Got Talent let the spectators vote for their favorite performance. I think we wanted to get Yale's position, as in like the Yale student body, um, seeing like which, what kind of Chinese culture do they prefer. And the student judges provided lively commentary for each contestant. The dress is ghastly, the choreography, I think I've seen more expressivity and seizures. Um. We sort of like the models of other cultural shows where it's more audience participation. So we came up with this idea of a talent show. It started really early, um, but we started working on it in, in earnest probably around March. So I guess it's thought about a talent show and then naturally we wanted to come up with a catchy name. So we came up with Cause It's Got Talent. The presentation of Chinese culture and performance juxtaposed traditional versus new. But it wasn't the climactic showdown that it sounded like it would be. Instead, old and new combined on stage, forming a new way to look at Chinese and Chinese American culture. Familiar Chinese love songs shared the stage with boy band dance steps. And the irhu, the traditional stringed instrument, could be heard after the acoustic guitar. Although the show focused on Chinese culture, neither the performers nor their acts necessarily had to fit into that category. I'm Belly Ann at Yale, and another thing, interesting fact is that I actually started Belly dancing in China. So I took a gap year um, between my sophomore and junior year and uh, went to China. When I got the email about the Chinese uh, cultural showcase, I'm like, well, this is kind of perfect. Um, you know, I, I could like contribute to something that I've learned in China. And also, um, another thing is like, if you have noticed, a lot of the performers, they were not Chinese. And so I think that, you know, the understanding of cultures does not just pertain to um, being Chinese, but also just uh, being open to different cultures in general. Act after act, the show brought the audience a glimpse into the students' many entertaining abilities. Well, they were all fantastic. Um, you know, you had a great variety as well. You had um, someone playing with the traditional Chinese yoga. Davis Nguyen, who is the president of the Vietnamese Student Association, did a really cool lie detecting trick where he was actually reading body gestures um, to detect if the person is lying and through that he was able to guess what card the person picked up. But in the end, there could only be one winner. With his ability to tell if someone was lying just by looking at their facial twitches or vocal hesitancy, Davis Nguyen won the viewers favor. After seeing all the other amazing acts go on, I was like, wow, I have to follow up. My heart was beating, I was nervous, was all this tension. I was like, oh man, I just wanted to be over with. But as soon as I took on the stage, I felt so comfortable. And people were just shouting, I love you. I was like, oh. Casa Scott Talent has proven how collaborative and fun it can be to delve into another culture. So if you have a skill that you would like to share, don't be shy. Visit YaleCasa.com and see what the group has in store for next year's cultural showcase. This has been Patrice Bowman reporting for YTV. Back to you in the studio. Thanks, Patrice. We will look forward to future CASA events. The group hopes for increased camps involvement in the future. As always, we leave you with the highlights of this week's Everybody Has a Story segment. Cody Pomeran sat down with Andrew Claster the Deputy Chief Analytics Officer for President Obama's 2012 campaign to discuss how data crunchers have become key to winning elections. Andrew, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. So, Deputy Chief Analytics Officer. I, I, I want to jump into to analytics, but I'm sure a lot of viewers um, don't know what analytics is and, and what your job was on a day-to-day -day basis. Can you talk about uh, what you do as a Deputy Chief Analytics Officer and what kind of data you deal with? Sure. So uh, the campaign has all kinds of data coming in. We have data from the field, from our volunteers and field organizers. We have data from uh, polling that we're conducting. There's a lot of public data that is available about uh, what TV 
uh, buys are being placed, um, you know, public polling, everything, uh, everything that's out there, as well as uh, whatever's being published in the media. And so our job on the campaign was to uh, try and figure out how to use that data, both the internal data and the external data, to uh, inform campaign decisions, to make decisions, uh, to help uh, campaign leadership make decisions about where to invest resources and what to invest resources in, uh, whether it be uh, TV advertising or uh, social media or online ads or uh, voter contact, uh, voter registration, persuasion, et cetera. I know you deal with things like persuasion indicators, like how likely a certain factor is uh, to persuade a voter, Democrat or Republican. Mm -hmm. What are the most significant indicators that you saw during both you know, 2008 and 2012? So uh, there are a lot of people who, going into a campaign, um, either have already made up their mind or they are uh, exceptionally unlikely to change their mind in response to contact uh, from us. So we're trying to identify people who, uh, who are most likely to, uh, to change their mind in response to a contact from us, and what kind. You know, there are some people who respond to, uh, who are going to respond to an email or to an online ad. There are other people who are going to respond to uh, a neighbor or a friend who uh, calls them up on the phone or comes by and knocks uh, on their door and talks to them. And so for every, uh, for every individual, it depends. Um, it depends on the medium uh, and it depends on the message as well. And so we're trying to target the right message in the right medium to uh, the right voter. They target uh, uh, a whole range of voters ba based on a lot of information, based on a lot of indicators. Do you see us getting to a point where advertisers or campaigns are becoming too intrusive into personal data? Yeah, I think one question is, uh, you know, a lot of the data we use, it's not new that this is available. A lot of this data has been available for decades. Um, voter files are public, for example. Um, and uh, the proprietary data we have about you know, people's, uh, people interacting with the campaign um, is data that every organization collects. So I can understand um, you know, a lot of people, I think, get the sense that, uh, that there's a lot of data out there um, about them. But I think, uh, I think they have to uh, think about you know, how it's being used. And really, we're trying to use it in a way that is effective. So that when we are, uh, for example, targeting someone for voter registration, we're targeting people who aren't already registered to vote. So presumably it's in the interest, not only in our best interest, but also in the interest of the voter um, to, uh, to, uh, to get messages that are relevant to them. Now, when, when building and, and analytics stuff, I know you guys were kind of called the, the geek squad of, of the Obama campaign. But when going out and building this yeah, geek squad or this analytics staff, how important is a balance between people who know the political realm and know the technical realm? I know you started off in 2008 as a field organizer for the yep. Obama campaign, so you had some background in this. How important is it to have political background and not just technical skill? That's a great question. Um, we, uh, we wanted a mix. So uh, it's important to us, we built a team of more than 50 uh, analytics professionals, modelers, analysts, etc. So it was important to us to have um, a number of people who had worked on political campaigns before to have uh, a certain amount of knowledge and experience in the way campaigns are run, but it was uh, at least as important to us to, uh, to bring in people who had never worked in politics before. Um, and so, you know, in addition to even those of us who've worked in politics also have a lot of other experience. Um, you know, I've, I've got private sector experience. Other folks who have worked on the campaign since 08 had previous experience working as consultants, working in finance, working as modelers. Um, and so, uh, and so you know, people were bringing a lot of different kinds of experience to the table. And so it was important to us to have that, uh, that kind of environment where there was a lot of knowledge transfer um, among individuals. So that, um, so that there were multiple people one could turn to if you had a question about political data or about past election results or about um, individual voter behavior, as well as all of the technical questions um, and, uh, and other questions we deal with regarding human behavior and modeling and statistics and software, et cetera. Andrew Plaster, thank you for joining us. My pleasure, thank you. And thank you for joining us for this week's segment of Everybody Has a Story. Back to you in the studio. To watch the full interview, go to yaledailynews.com slash YTV under Features. 
That's it for tonight. Thanks for watching YTV. We'll see you next Sunday at 5 p.m.